Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. If you like the content here, make sure that you click like and subscribe and hit that notification bell for updates on future videos. Today we're looking at the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. We're just doing a quick, brief overview today. You know, if you're new to Reformed theology like, like I am, I've only been uh, exploring the Reformed theology for the last two years, when you hear about a confession of faith, you're like, ooh, what is this? Doctrines of men? No, 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 no. I follow the Bible. I don't follow doctrines of men. I'm not into this confession of faith stuff. It sounded weird to me. You know, if it sounds weird to you, it sounded weird to me too. But if you go to a local church, it's more than likely that that church will have some kind of statement of faith or a list of what we believe on their website. Well, that defines orthodoxy for that local church. Likewise, the confession here that I have today uh, also defines orthodoxy for Reformed Baptists, and that's what this is. And this, uh, when you hear people talk about the confession or the 1689, I'm a 1689 guy, you hear talk like that, this is what they're talking about, the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, sometimes called the Second London Baptist Confession, <clears throat> or similar words. Now this one is from Founders. Let me see, founders.org there. But don't worry, I'm going to have uh, links in the description. So when we open it up, we find, let's take a look right here at this table of contents. We have lots of chapters here on the scriptures, God and the Holy Trinity, God's decree, creation, and so on. Effectual calling, justification, adoption, sanctification. Hey, those are really important. You know, maybe we should look at those. The law of God, civil government, marriage, the church, and all the way down to the last judgment. You know, I'm really glad baptism is in there because being a Baptist, I'd like to know <laughs> what do Reformed Baptists think about baptism. But I'm just going to take you through this briefly and just show you a couple of things that, that I'm encouraged by. So remember... Um, this defines orthodoxy, but this is subject to Scripture. So this can only um, stand on Scripture. Scripture comes first. If, if this is wrong in any place, Scripture wins. Okay, so we come over here to chapter 1, and it is on the Holy Scriptures. Now, here's the thing that uh, um, really just blew my mind. And that is about interpreting scripture, right? So here in chapter 1, paragraph 9, we find that the infallible rule for interpreting scripture is the scripture itself. Therefore, when there is a question about the true, full meaning of any part of scripture, and each passage has only one meaning, not many, it must be understood in light of other passages that speak more clearly. I've got this, the first line highlighted there. So what that means is Scripture interprets Scripture. The greatest commentary ever written on the Bible is the Bible itself. And that's really what this is saying. So it's saying that this rule is infallible. Um, actually, it doesn't say the infallible. Yeah, the infallible rule. <laughs> saying that this rule is infallible because the Holy Spirit inspired Scripture. Therefore, any time that Scripture interprets itself, that interpretation is infallible. So let's look at an example of what that even means um, for Scripture to inter interpret Scripture. Uh, recently, I've been reading a book by Richard Barcellus, whose name is on the back of this, um, called Getting the Garden Right. And he starts off with a really in-depth discussion of Scripture interpreting Scripture, also known as uh, analogia, analogia Fidei, which is analogy of faith, but it means scripture interprets scripture. So if we get the Bible out and we go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. We generally understand the serpent here to be Satan, but how do we know that? Well, it's discussed in chapter 12 of Revelation. It tells us exactly who that is. It says, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. That ancient serpent, 
He is the devil and Satan. So Revelation speaks more clearly as to who this is in Genesis. We have just allowed scripture to interpret scripture. So that's what that's saying. This has been revolutionary for me because it means you don't just do a word search in the Bible. Like, hey, I want to know what this particular word means in this verse. You don't go to another verse that uses that same word, but is about a completely different topic. You would never do that because that, that would never work. And that's what the confession is saying here. It's giving you a guide for interpreting scripture, which from a dispensational point of view, that was revolutionary for me. I've never heard that before. Because I, I came from a dispensational background. Now, there's another section I like in here on God's law. And it just talks about the moral law, the ceremonial laws, and the judicial laws. And how the judicial laws that were for Israel have been um, uh, abrogated. They no longer apply to us. But the... <clears throat> moral equivalence of them does. So the general principles have moral value. So like, we're not required to put uh, a parapet around our house, the roof of our house. But you're still responsible for the safety of your guests, right? You're trying to keep people from falling off your roof. Well, at your house, you know, you don't want to uh, be negligent for causing someone's in injury. So the moral value um, still remains the general principles of the judicial law. And I, and I like that. You know, I again, in the dispensational background, these kinds of things aren't really talked about. And I like that the confession addresses these. And then lastly, real quick, this section on civil government. I like this chapter here, which says that Christians may lawfully and uh, accept and carry out the duties of public office when called to do so. And in performing their office, they must especially maintain justice and peace according to the wholesome laws of each kingdom or other political entity. To carry out these duties, they are authorized now under the New Testament to wage war in just and necessary situations. So it's just saying that all, uh, Christians can be officers of civil government and that when you uh, serve in such a role to do it faithfully. And I think that's a good encouragement because there are some people that think you should never be in civil government and the confession's like, no, 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 it's perfectly, it's perfectly okay. So that's just a quick overview of the confession of faith. Again, remember, this is subject to scripture. This defines orthodoxy, but only through scripture. It's not that this is the doctrine of men. No, no, no. This is a summarization of what men have found in the scriptures. Okay, so everything has scriptural support. Uh, you may not agree with those interpretations. So we see we have um, scripture references for all sorts of uh, different concepts here. But you should be a Berean. Seek out that scripture and see whether or not the confession is right. And uh, I've really enjoyed this. I've really enjoyed reading the confession and uh, hope that this sheds a little light on what that's about for you. All right. Well, thanks again. Remember to click like and subscribe and have a great day.